Good evening, everybody. Good evening on Facebook. Good evening around the world. Welcome, Cecilia Ledin, co-host and co-programmer of Nordisk Panorama. Welcome to Hubert Sauper, who uh, I got to know in 2005 working at ITFA. Um, and hopefully you saw Darwin's Nightmare and we come as friends. That's now on the platform of Nordisk Panorama. If you haven't seen it, you can still see it the coming days. Um, of course, before I introduce our guest, our world-renowned world guest, Hubert Sauper, who is a filmmaker, producer, teacher, uh, cinematographer, and even actor in the past. Um, uh, so before I introduce him, I will just introduce a bit about him and his work. <coughs> um, he is now uh, uh, director at Epicentro, uh, another winner at Sundance last January. It's an immersive and metaphorical portrait of post-colonial utopian Cuba. We will uh, talk about it later. Um, in Epicentro, he explores the century of interventionalism and myth-making together with the extraordinary people of Havana, uh, particularly its children, Leonelis and Anielis, who he calls the young prophets, to interrogate time imperialism and cinema itself. And um, in his previous film from 2014, We Come As Friends, which is a modern odyssey and dizzying science fiction-like journey into the heart of Africa, Hubert takes us on his voyage in his tiny self-made flying machine out of tin and canvas. He leads us into most improbable locations and into people's thoughts and dreams in both stunning and heartbreaking ways. But um, your breakthrough really came in 2004 with Darwin's Nightmare, which uh, got an Oscar nomination. It tells the story of the tragic situation unfolding in Tanzania on the shores of Lake Victoria, the largest tropical lake in the world. A local environmental disaster, business at the cost of human life, the poverty of ordinary people and the atmosphere of an impending war. Everything is intertwined into a terrible and contradictory plot. The film blew up world festivals, it's traveled all over the world, won countless awards and received global critical acclaim. Cecilia. Yes, hi. Um, but even before Darwin's Nightmare, uh, Hubert Salpo's first uh, cinematic encounter with Africa was in Kisangaria Diary from 1998. And now we'd like to bring the voice to you, Hubert, and have you talk a bit about your cinematic journey. We thought it would be nice to establish a kind of a cinematic or artistic timeline and maybe start with Kisangaria Diary, even though I know you've made other films, and maybe bring us from, from that first venture to Africa and over the, your other films for the last 25 years, over over Darwin's Nightmare and We Come as Friends, if you could give us some insight into, into uh, the, the, the first meeting with Africa and the way you came deeper and deeper through the next films. Could you give us some insight into that? So can you see me and hear yes. me? Yes. Cecilia and Martijn, I'm very, very uh, happy to see you. And uh, very honored. And uh, hello to everyone who's listening to us and watching us. So uh, let me get straight to the point. Um, a lot of I was born in a, in in Tyrol in the Austrian mountains, and uh, and I'm known for starting my career in the center of Africa. And of course, a lot of people say, "How did you get from the sound of music to the heart of darkness?" <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I can give you a, a, a tiny pitch on that. Uh, it's kind of a, an explanation that I found for myself uh, over the years. Uh, the, the, the reason why I, I left uh, my beautiful village, which, was, which is like this really beautiful small place, it is really very close where the sound of music, the, the, the movie was, was shot. Uh, mountain lakes, uh, Flowers on every house, uh, Tyrolean songs uh, uh, from peasants, uh, blue skies, lakes. Uh, the reason why I left is that I was a political refugee, uh, essentially, because uh, uh, when I went, when I ended school, I, I, I realized that uh, I had been growing up not only in this most beautiful place, but also surrounded by the demons of uh, the Third Reich. Uh, 
which were very much alive uh, when I was a kid, uh, and more than maybe uh, maybe other any other place on the planet, because in these uh, you know deep valleys of Tyrol, <coughs> these uh, demons uh, lived longer, and survived longer. Um, and uh, to give you another edge on top of that is that my my parents were innkeepers they had a little inn and uh, <clears throat> my dad was one of the only people in the, in the whole province who who spoke english so for some strange in some strange circumstance he he made a he he met a, a, a guy a, a very uh imposant, imposant uh, american person who, who was the one of the commanders of the frankfurt rhine mine air base the u.s air base so a u.s very high ranking general meets my father and uh, he knows that my dad has a little hotel in the beautiful mountains and uh, a ski school and he says we've got a problem here uh, we've got uh, all these guys coming back from vietnam and we can't send them back to to the States because Frankfurt Rhine Main was kind of a hub between the Vietnam War and the USA. So to make a long story short, I not only I grew up in this uh, Sound of Music, uh, beautiful landscape surrounded by old Nazis, but suddenly the, uh, the bomber pilots who just had to bomb the shit out of Vietnam, I got rid of the forest with Agent Orange uh, and Napalm. Um, came to the green mountains of Austria and to the inn of my dad to, to recover. So I grew up in this crazy uh, kind of uh, collision of realities and collision of, uh, of, uh, of worlds. Uh, and I ran away when I was 18. So that's why I ended up traveling until <laughs> now. now I'm, even now I'm in a, in a, in a guest house. <laughs> but so then, I don't well, know if that makes sense, but but uh, it's 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 uh, it's the reason why I'm, I'm interested in collisions and why I'm interested in in kind of very contradictory worlds meeting. That's why I got interested in uh, not necessarily in Africa as such, but I was interested more in what the hell we are we Europeans and Americans are doing there. Um, and as everyone knows. To understand who who you are or who we are, you understand that from from afar. Uh, in 1700, when I was born, 1998 uh, was to the center of the Congo, and uh, I was following refugees, and I I, I kind of afterwards realized that that was a theme that touched me because of my my own situation i mean i was not i didn't have a refugee status so but i was kind of running away for political reasons mm -hmm. from from home but and uh and then i came despite myself into into the midst of a civil war which was the beginning of this uh crazy conflict in the center of Africa, the, the, what's called the Great Lakes region. Um, and I, I witnessed acts of, acts of, of genocide, literally n not having been prepared in any way, not technically, not, not health-wise, not professionally. Uh, I was just um, witnessing this, this uh, outbreak of this war fully fully unprepared mm -hmm. and, uh, and i did have a little camera high eight it was like a revolution like you in denmark you were, you were at the forefront of this uh, dogma movement and um, i did i guess <clears throat> among other people the same in in, in non-fiction i suddenly had the freedom to to make cinema with a little thing in my pocket, which was a revolution for me because I, I went to film school learning how to, uh, we, we shot films in 16 millimeters and even 35 and we were editing film physically. Uh, and everything was of course very complicated and expensive and slow. And uh, suddenly I had this high eight camera and I was you know, the king of the world in that sense. And I could document suddenly something very intimate and also something 
so terrifying that there is um, it's just impossible to to even start describing you know i mean kisangani diary is uh, not only the worst chapter of my existence, but it's uh, probably to anyone who sees it, the worst imagery that they have ever seen. Um, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's certainly a film that stays I, with I, you. I, I, I mean, I hope you don't. Yeah. It's, uh, can, but then I can ask yeah. you, because I find this really interesting. So when you come to, to make your first film there, Kisangari Diary, you, you know very little about the situation. You're just basically there and you experience and you film it. And what brings you to the next film, so to speak, Darwin's Nightmare? I mean, when you go back, is it then a need to dig deeper, to be more <clears throat> prepared in a way of what you're going to find or what you want to tell? Um, well, what what was what most striking for me uh, in in Kisangani in this in the Congo and during this war was that I was um, almost despite myself again uh, being a white guy uh, around other white guys and and um, among people who were trafficking guns and who were flying big Illusion jets to transport Kalashnikovs and. Um, I'm, I was kind of I was hosted. I was squatting in the in the in the back room of of the office of um, an Israeli ex fighter pilot uh, who opened up a shop and had a little airline, also running um, ammunition from one party to the other, other, flying for the rebels at night and flying for the government for Zaire for Mobutu in the in the in the daytime. So I was in the middle of this crazy world, and and I I made friends with these Russian uh, ex Soviet. Uh, cargo pilots who then brought me physically with their uh, Antonov Ilyushin with these crazy flying fortresses to the small town called Mwanza in Tanzania. They had an air bridge to bring food to the refugees into the Congo. And on one occasion, I, I saw that these, these guys were flying um, a very cheap uh, yellow beans or something for refugees from Europe or from US AID coming from the US to Tanzania and then being flown into the Congo to the refugees. But the same planes would carry very high high uh, protein and very high end uh, food, which was fish fillet from the Lake Victoria to, to Europe. And then mm. I figured, you know, the obvious question is how come that you fly out all this food when people are hungry here, etc. And then, and then came uh, almost organically, the the the, the idea of, uh, of of doing a film on that, and which became then uh, a sort of case study um, called Darwin's Nightmare, and uh, that is a, a case study of of you know the 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 le bateau ivre de la globalisation. It's like uh, the, 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 the 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 ship that goes out of uh, control that is called globalisation that sails to I don't know where you know. And, um, and we have a clip. We I have mean, a now clip. this is 18 years ago or 17, 17 years ago. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I sorry. There's delay. I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. Uh, we have a clip from Darwin's yeah. Nightmare. Yeah. We, maybe you should see that now, and then we can continue the talk. Is that okay? So we'll show the clip from Darwin's Nightmare. Oh, that's good Nightmare. for me. Yeah. God, unfortunately, he created the world, and he. He, he, he invested in some limited uh, natural resources. Therefore, people tend to scramble for these natural resources, and that what is happening today. Formerly, there was a, a scramble of Africa, a scramble of land of Africa. But now, it seems uh, as if scramble there is a, a scramble of natural resources of the world. Who is to get and who is to miss? And that is uh, the law of the jungle. Those strong and tough animals, they have the chance of surviving more than the weak one. When we say the stronger in, uh, in, this, in our world we are living, maybe we, we start viewing the Europeans as stronger than the, 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 the rest. Because they are the people who, are, who, who own the IMF. They are the people who own the World Bank. They are the people who own the, the World Trade. 
murky depths, there is no sign of life. Even the light fights a losing battle. The first is eutrophication of the lake, in other words, the steadily falling oxygen level. This is the predator that has devastated the lake's ecological chain. After thousands of years of flourishing evolution, some 210 species of cichlids have suddenly vanished. The cichlids, which feed on algae and waste, played a vital role in maintaining the health and vitality of the lake. The perch's cannibalism could well interfere with the plans of the commercial fishing industry, destined to become its own worst enemy. By devouring its own young, the perch is eliminating all hope for the future. Well, it was just one man who brought the fish with one bucket on one afternoon and put it in the lake. One man with one bucket on one afternoon. And that was it. And all the scientific discussion was... Uh, yeah, was over, in fact. The fish was there. The story of the Nile perch offers a series of strange paradoxes which threatens to turn the world's second largest lake into a barren sinkhole. And a once vibrant lake on the shores of which local fishermen could one day starve to death. Feel that's a very telling uh, scene, uh, Hubert. Um, you can really see what the kind of themes uh, you address, like colonization and imperialism, and the whims and workings of global powers and propaganda. Um, of course, still there is a difference between Darwin's nightmare and We Come as Friends. Uh, how would you describe that? And what was your development as a filmmaker uh, with We Come as Friends? Wow, that's a that's a tough question, uh, Martin. <laughs> um, uh, well, watching watching this scene now, this scene, I mean, I I, I hope it makes sense for people who see only this, because uh, to give you a context, it was essentially a film screening within a, a conference of ministers in uh, Kenya, with ministers from all over the center of Africa. And the movie that was shown was a movie made by scientists depicting that the Lake Victoria is, is fucked, so to say. Um, and I was filming the ministers commenting on that and they gave this kind of class 
of how films should be made, which is very interesting, you know, being taught by African ministers how films should be made. They shouldn't be just jumping, they should show the good things. And that's a typical discourse. It's a, it's a global trend. And to bring this, I come to your question later in a second, uh, Martin. What is interesting that, that is, is that any company, any uh, cultural group, any religious group, um, any uh, band of, of humans uh, need to express their ex existence now in audiovisuals. And, and nations, for example, are, have become... Uh, products that have a product um, identity and and uh, 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 like a, a value on the on the on the uh, à la bourse, no, and at the at the stock market, so to say, and uh, African nations, especially uh, who are ran by uh, more or less dictatorial uh, uh, people, like the ones we just saw in the scene. Um, claim the copyright on their own nation, so to say. So they say like, we, we are Tanzanians, we want to show Tanzania. And, and the aftermath of this story, by the way, was that I was uh, physically threatened. I had lawsuits. I had three, three years of, of very, very horrible uh, life after the nomination of, to the Oscars of, my, of this movie. Not because of the movie, it was because it's called the Oscars and then they, the alarm bells ring and and the, uh, the the nation's head of the nation went personally after me, organized uh, rallies, uh, death threats, etc., and a cyber attack already six, 17, 18 years ago, uh, or 15 years ago. So, but to come to your question, Martin, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm 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 I was just referring to the scene we just saw. Um, I mean, essentially, I'm always holding the camera. I'm, I am in all my films um, going through a very, let's say, rich and uh, contradictory uh, uh, phase of life. Um, I'm throwing myself into a, into a new reality where, where I'm not where I'm not always ready to, to uh, for it, or not always kind of um, have all the tools or all the the, the keys to understand this world. Um, and I am exposing myself to an, to an experience which is, which is unique because I can, you know, spend, let's say for the last maybe three years, uh, living in, in old Havana and, um, and it was an experience that, that is unique thanks to, you know, our system of, of, of funding movies. And, uh, and I translate this experience into, uh, into what is called a cinema experience, what is, what is called a movie. What I, what is maybe the difference between Darwin's Nightmare and, and We Come as Friends was that Come as Friends was, of course, more um, reflected, more, uh, let's say, um, philosophical. It's a stupid word, but, um, and Darwin's Nightmare was, uh, was uh, still like, uh, what do you say in, in French, in, in cat, like, like um, um, interrogation, uh, investigation. And it was also playing on a, on a relatively simple um, chord that that um, I don't find the English word indignation uh, indignation uh, that that puts people in in, in a state of uh, indignation you know, in a state of uh, of anger and and how can this be and you know and and I wanted to. Um, go away from that because it's it's a kind of a vein that I, I I'm not um, any more interested in I'm not interested in, in uncovering the injustice or or like opening the eyes of people or showing that there I mean nobody knows nobody needs Hubert to uh, to show that people are starving in, in, in Africa that there is prostitution uh, child labor um, hunger I, I, I don't want this, to, to take on this role and mm -hmm. with Darwin's Nightmare it was still in part was that yeah you know. of course it's also a road um, movie but uh, a so road movie I, want, I think I want Sorry. I want more I want... <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it seems uh, that your that the search is also very important maybe in one... become as friends <laughs> yeah okay when maybe one one uh, main difference I can give you is uh, Darwin's Nightmare was uh, uh, a place I was concentrating on, a small town called Mwanza in Tanzania, 
and the the elements came to me the, the airplanes came with the guns the, the the street children were there the fish factories where the fish came into this place the prostitutes flocked in when the fish was there because fish brought the planes pilots and the pilots were the clients of the prostitutes etc and uh, we come as friends was an odyssey it was essentially mm -hmm. the, the narrative of uh, of science fiction science fiction means uh, traveling in, into time and space and uh, and encountering odd and unknown and uh, potentially hostile uh, worlds and 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 the others the aliens so i was for moving forward with my own little plane uh, out of out of canvas and uh, tin <laughs> can yeah. my my kind of flying clown machine so to say yeah. <laughs> perhaps it's uh, it's a good so time there uh, i think yeah there's a bit of a delay, so so sorry for interrupting you, but it's uh, automatically. Um, maybe we can just see a clip from uh, We Come As Friends. It's about three minutes. Uh, it's a clip um, where the missionaries from Texas uh, uh, start talking. Roll the clip, We Come As Friends. God wants to protect them. And, um, and yes, there are all these evil forces at work here, um, and that's real. It's not imaginary. It's real. God spoke to me and said, if you're going to stay in Sudan, you must go and pray with those children. Yeah. Where we minister to the spirit, to the body. You know, we bring in clothes whenever we can. Yeah. And, uh, so when I first started coming here, there was like very little clothing out in the villages. The, the kids would come, some in clothing, some in naked, you know, kind of clothing optional. And it, they just don't care. It's for their health. I mean, you you go 25 kilometers or 40 kilometers north, 25 miles north of where we're setting, and there are people that literally have no clothes at all. You know, and really the cultural things that we're trying to change are the only only the things that are against the Bible. When I tell the story of the creation, it says at the beginning they were naked and they were not ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> A large percentage of the people I'm telling the story to are naked. So well, I'm not going to talk about being. I don't want to. Uh, well, how shall I say this? <laughs> See, it's uh, solar powered. Can we just let's show it? Yeah. 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 So, so when the woman saw that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed big leaves together and made themselves void. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Man was white and hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Hey, you want to show him how you dance? When you sing? For a filmmaker, uh, Hubert, this must be uh, amazing to shoot this. You can never put this in a script. <laughs> what do you feel seeing this again? And how did you feel screening uh, or filming this? Um, <laughs> that's a, 
it's very amazing that you chose this scene because um, um, it, it is one of the most violent uh, scenes I, I've ever filmed. And that said, it is more violent, of course, even in, in, in the film, because you, you understand the context and you understand also, I mean, it, it throws your, your own narrative into your own face because you, like, I guess all of the three of us, when we were children, we heard in school that uh, poor Africans don't have clothes. We have to send our used clothes to, to the, I mean, and why do they need clothes? Of course, is that because they have to function in our logic and they have to, you know, wear boots and uniforms and Kalashnikovs and, and guard our pipelines to um, keep the oil flowing, you know, because a naked man with a spear is not going to guard it. So it, it is essentially, it's, it is the beginning of the end. The, 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 mm -hmm. the naked kid with the white socks is that that's the beginning of its end and the end of, a, of, a, of an epoch and maybe the end of humans as, as we knew them. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing just to give you a, is that in the movie, we come as friends. Within 10 minutes, there is a scene shot by a soldier from South Sudan with actual acts of killing, mm -hmm. where the, the, the army of South Sudan shot their own auto-propaganda, uh, people executed on the ground. And I found this footage, and it's, it's a part of the end of the movie. That scene is not as violent in the perception of most cinema goers than white socks on a naked child. And that tells something about cinema and, and of course about Africa and Europe and narrative. That is, uh, that is very fascinating to me. What, yeah, what and kicks I, you, what, feel, what uh, I feel you have seen a million times. I, feel, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I feel it's much more effective to show this than uh, the violence that you also see on the news every day, because that's what makes us, <laughs> not feel anymore and not understanding it but this scene shows so much about the history of our history the current situation the fact that so much has been destroyed beliefs languages cultures etc uh, nature of course also so um i'm amazed I, 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 i'm that's why i maybe took the scene or maybe i shouldn't have done so but i mean it says so much so um yeah thank you <laughs> It, it is it is um, it is effective for you, and I guess it's effective for literally uh, for visually uh, literate people. Uh, it is maybe not effective for 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 mainstream, because that's why it's so important. What you guys are doing is you are you are kind of pushing the boundaries of this of this language, um, that these debates and your festivals that you organize. They are pushing the boundaries of, of our narrative, of our language, our visual language, and it is it hits a nail for for you because you have seen a thousand films in your life or a hundred thousand, um, uh, uh, but it does not meet, um, let's say, a, a more a less educated um, audience, visually less educated. So that is an important thing. Um, I have to say one more thing to that scene. That's also very important. In almost every film, I hold a camera and I shoot uh, 99%. Sometimes I give away the camera and then you suddenly see my own face, like almost by coincidence, like in a, in a bar or something, and then it ends up in the film. This scene uh, uh, where the missionaries are clapping and the kid, um, it has the white socks. I was about to film it and I almost broke down. I was like, I can't do this anymore. You know, what am I doing? It's like this famous like, what am I doing? What the fuck am I doing here with these people like violating the, the intimacy of these, uh, these beautiful people in, in the South of Sudan. Um, and my, my co-pilot from my little airplane, Barney Broomfield, who is a brilliant young filmmaker uh, he saw that I was in despair and he just took it, took over. So he took the camera and he shot that, that very scene. Um, um, with the baby on the ground, very nicely shot by the way. Mm. So I, I, I owe, I owe him for that. <laughs> uh, and it was literally, he 
just saw that I can't do this anymore. I, I just, I was just like, that's it. <laughs> like, but of course, we were both, uh, uh, let's say, the, the essence of working with uh, with someone like Barney was that we we were living in the fullest way possible everything we saw and everything we experienced. And you just see that. Oh, look at this guy. Listen to the voice, the beautiful voice of this old man. Uh, did you see the light in the behind the, the, the straw hats? Did you, so we were just in this kind of constant hype, um, uh, amazed and, and and horrified and everything. So this this kind of hyper experience almost is is possible when you're in a dialectic and intellectual dialectic uh, and artistic dialectic with someone. And usually I have someone with me uh, who is this uh, alter ego. But usually I hold the camera, but in this shot, Barney did, and I was, I have to really give him credit, he's, uh, he's, he's brilliant, yeah. I'm curious to hear more about what you talk about cinematic literacy, but we can maybe come to that towards the end, because for now I think we could build a bridge to your cinematic yeah. process, your creative process, because you make it look very easy in a way. I mean, you're there, you meet people, you have a certain approach, but I just imagine the, the, what has, the planning and the research that's got into it. So you know what you're looking for once you go there. Could you give us some insight into how you, how you plan your, your, your films or you, how you research them? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, also an interesting question. Um, other than most people think, I mean, some people think, you know, I'm, I'm this weird adventurer who just goes off and, and films whatever comes across, which is of course not the case. I'm very conceptual. Um, I, I write a lot, I'm, I'm, I, I read a lot. I have a big team of research sometimes. Whereas at the actual shooting, I'm very often all alone with one person in the middle of the night in the middle of Africa. So, so that's, that's the irony of, of this kind of filmmaking. <laughs> um, uh, I think you, 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 you gave the answer already. It's, it is, it is what I said before with my work with Barney or with Xavier or with uh, uh, Zmorda or any, uh, many people who accompanied me. Um, Shandor was my, my friend in, in Tanzania with Diamond's Nightmare. Uh, you you create a a, a cloud or of 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 thought and energy around around the theme around something of questioning and amazement and 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 with this energy with this conditioning of your own kind of eye and 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 and, and senses and your soul you you discover the world in a very very different way. Mm. You know, because because in itself, a kid with white socks is is nothing. It's just, it means nothing. What does it mean? I and mean, what is it? Uh, it's just okay. It's maybe it's very white and very and very black. But even that, most people wouldn't wouldn't even bother about seeing that, or wouldn't if they would see the the, the contrast, it wouldn't would maybe make a nice photograph or. But it's only so strong for you because you as an audience because you would ultimately uh, make the film the last part of the the, the, the script of the film is the audience mm -hmm. and you with your set of, of uh, associations with your set of experiences in your own life it can become this crazy cocktail and this powerful thing that is that is really life experience uh, and it's really triggering something that makes you creative in your thinking etc um you know, it's the famous <laughs> uh, thought about the film being written four times. The first time on on paper is a script. The second time with a camera uh, shot. The third time edited. It's a different kind of writing again, and uh, and the fourth time in 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 the eyes of the audience, and only then it is a movie. After the fourth uh, time of of rewriting from the original idea. Maybe you could so, talk about. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know if I've, uh, I gave you a good answer, or Cecilia. Yeah. You gave me a fine answer, and it just brings me to my next question. I don't know I if mean, that's good. Like, good enough, yeah. But I mean, the the you, you're 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 thematically prepared when you get there. Your 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 senses are sharpened. You find what you want to find. You film a lot. 
right? I mean, this is the feeling you get. You film a lot, which brings me to the editing situation, uh, the editing uh, process. How does that work? Where, when and where mm. is the film as a story structured? Is that in the editing room or is that on paper? Um, well, it is very structured on paper because I, I kind of write a story, so to say, which then I send in and get some money for it, for the story. <laughs> um, but of course, the uh, the the actual the actual yeah, it's like a few piece of paper. It's worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It's that's as strange as it sounds, but um, but the um, uh, let's say the the reality always over over is always much better than I I would have thought. You know, it's like the, it's it's the, let's say. I, I, I write I write a, a scene, let's say um, an ambassador of the United States talking to the local tribal people in Sudan. Uh, I, I wrote the story before it actually happens because I know how the brain of American ambassadors more or less are ticking. I know what their discourse is. I know what their jargon is of humanitarian together, development, future, light, uh, bringing light and all this bullshit. So I know what's going to come and I can write it on paper. And then when I meet an actual European uh, diplomat in, 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 in Maasai land, <laughs> then that more or less I'm, I'm so sensibilized and I'm so ready to mm -hmm. kind of get that. And I grabbed it, the situation and I, and I'm all my, all my antennas are out. Because that's the moment of truth, of course. When when you're filming nonfiction, you, you don't have two shots. It's only like it's now or never. It's like happening or not. Mm. And um, to come to a, a precise example, in this case, uh, um, uh, the American ambassador in, in, in South Sudan gives a, a speech to the locals opening an electric power station. And he says things that you would never be able to write or, or even imagine. He says, we, we bring light to you people, which is the colonial, uh, uh, you know, narrative since ever, because we Europeans are white and full of light and full of knowledge and full of uh, pure pureness and 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 beauty and clean cleanness. And you guys uh, are in, in the shadow, in the dark, in the in the abyss, and we need to uplift you. So, so and he actually spells it out. He says it in the context of. He says, we literally and figuratively bring you light, you, you the black people. So it's unbelievable, but it is only possible to film it because I was kind of ready mm. that for that line. I knew something was going to come in that, in that kind of uh, quality. And, and, not, and of course, when that happens, uh, what is very important also as a filmmaker is to, to contextualize it and to make it into a scene that is f physically, uh, cinematographically um, uh, interesting too, because you have mm. to, you cannot just uh, uh, see a guy talking uh, and then cut like in a TV show, uh, uh, someone uh, reacting. It has to be a scene that you understand that physically he's very close to the the dancing tribesmen. You have to understand that there's wind and the American flag is being pushed over that there's people with guns guarding this this man while he talks about peace etc so all these things are a context that is also important mm. but the line that he's this in this case this ambassador is delivering is just gold i mean gold in the sense of uh, uh of, of movie making and it's it and it's it's very dark to be honest uh, in in the in the in the sense of uh, you know colonial and uh, uh uh, history and history of, of slavery and uh, suppression and, and and disregard and uh, humiliation, etc. Who? But we have one. We have one more clip from uh, from uh, so, Thomas friends. So we'll see that one, right, Martin? Yep. Yeah. So we'll see the next clip from We Come as Friends. That very one. They bring guns. I have 
to be quiet. I will not say anything. The British established the constitution of the Sudan. They, they carry Bible in the right hand and they carry guns in the left hand. Yeah. And they come and take all our goods and leave. For future leaders, which is uh, Americans, British, China, let them not forget that God will will uh, give our children the health. Uh, they will give them uh, a clean brain. They will revenge one day in a different way. So these British let them know that the great great children they will not have access to come to Africa. And Americans too let them know that the great great children they will not have access to come to Africa. And China too, and French. Because these children are growing up. Mm. Of course, the human beings, they have brains. They will come up with different solutions. Mm. Every human being has a dignity of living, but they forgot about that. My education is, is not, I'm not in a level of uh, university. I finished my student school certificate. But of me being in America in 16 years, mm. I know a lot. You know, I know a lot. Our people have been deceived. Yeah. Even the military, they talk to you according to the military level. Not everybody's military, mm. you know. And then I will blame our top people. They don't have, yeah. wait, they don't take, they don't take the pictures. Yeah. I was in my first year senior. Uh, we have a song to our politicians. We call them, these are the poor politicians. What do you mean a song? You had a song? Yeah, I have, a, I have a song, but um, um, you know, a song has to be written down and then you can sing it perfectly. But what is it, more or less, what is it about? Um, it was about uh, my land, my land, my land, my land. In my land there's much rain. In my land there's more sun. My land is evergreen and lovely. Our poor politician has denied our rights. Our poor politicians has denied our rights, my land. And then after when we sung that song, there is becoming a problem. And then some of our students, they were arrested. Some of them were beaten to death in a place called uh, Bethel Abiyat. Uh, in English, they say the White House. So some of them were locked up. We don't know where they are. And then... So that's why you had to leave America? That's why I have to leave Juba completely. Because of the song? Because of the song. Because um, we, we try our best, but we always fail. But maybe this, this time, maybe we will uh, achieve something out of this referendum. This scene is also, uh, I think, a good uh, bridge to Epicentro in a way, Hubert, because this is also about agency and giving a voice to people who have something to say and something uh, worthwhile to say. And in your film Epicentro, you have, among many characters, two amazing girls, uh, and you let them speak, and, you, and we are all amazed seeing them. Of course, the film still has to be uh, released. Um, we have two little, two small clips from Epicentro, but maybe first you want to say just a few words about uh, your new film. <laughs> um, you, you mean Epicentro or the one I'm going to make next? No, um, just talk a bit about Epicentro. Of course, the people uh, in this masterclass probably haven't seen yeah. your new film yet. So, um, uh, can you b tell us yeah. a bit about okay, how, no, how no, you conceived it? I have to be very... Uh... 
Um, now, now I have to be very uh, concentrated. Uh, Epicentro is uh, my latest film. It's, uh, it came out in Sundance um, before the world closed down. Um, it, is, it is essentially a, a movie about how the United States became a, an empire, but more importantly, how it invented, invented its own narrative. And the United States is the biggest empire that the, the planet has ever uh, seen. Uh, and it's, it is the empire of the image and uh, of the moving images, which is our, our industry. And uh, very ironically, the uh, cinema uh, was invented precisely at the same time, uh, 1895, 1898. Uh, 1898 was a famous explosion of an American battleship in the middle of the night in Havana that led to the Spanish-American War, that led to the American victory and let's say 900 US flags all over the planet today. But uh, what is important and, and what I was kind of finding out that not only it happened in Havana, which is the epicentro, which also was the epicenter in a way of slave trade and uh, which was the first city in the world which was really cosmopolitan. So it's, it's the center of uh, slave trade, it's the center of globalization, Havana, uh, or, or the, the nucleus of globalization. And uh, that's why I shot Epicentro. But the interesting thing is that the United States became an empire n n not naturally because it was, a, was and is, of course, a, a superpower industrially uh, superior. But 120 years ago, most Americans did not want interventionism, did not want to send their children overseas to the Philippines or to the Caribbean to die on, on, on battleships. Uh, they did not want to become this uh, colonial power that, would, that the US themselves celebrate of having gotten rid of. The Independence Day is nothing else but celebrating to get rid of colonial powers. And now, uh, of course, the US turns into what it was trying to get rid of. And uh, it turned into that with the help of a new invention in 1898 that was uh, a mass hypnotizing tool that is called cinema. And uh, to give you another little hint uh, that about Epicenter is that the first films that the United States citizens saw in history in their lives was 1898 moving images. Uh, they were to a big extent made by Thomas Alva Edison's camera people. And they were documentaries, but they were all fake. So the, the naval battles uh, that were shown, the Battle of Manila, the Battle of Santiago de Cuba, uh, sinking the Spanish fleet, etc., they were all made in, in little uh, model boats out of wood uh, in a bathtub in New York with firecrackers and smoke from cigars. So that's, uh, so the American empire was essentially born in a bathtub with firecrackers in 1898. So that's the story of Epicentro. Perhaps uh, this is a, a, a good bridge. Let's see a, a clip. It's a clip where we can see um, what the question is addressed. What is Utopia, US as an attraction and uh, a horrible photographer entering many houses. Um, so let's roll the clip. What does Utopia mean for you? Utopia. 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 Utopia is something that, that, that do not exist in the reality. Yeah, no. It's a, something that we dream. I've got something that my baby wants. The people want to see the last communist country. Yeah. In the factory. Yeah, an attraction. Before the change. Lay me down with your gentle hand. 900 American flag military outposts in the world. And what is the moon? And what's the moon? <laughs> the moon of America. <laughs> Is it? We're going to make the moon great again. We're going to make the moon great again. America. The conditions that they have. 
pretty uh, tragic, pretty, uh, but I guess in certain circumstances you have no choice. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. So I gave him a pen because he was so nice. I gave him a pen from New York City, which he's yeah. really excited about. He's writing his name and stuff. And this other girl wants money for photographs, but I've never had him pay for photographs. Because to be photographed by me, it's an honor. That's so. Wow, stealing the soul of the people. <laughs> um, of course, I guess you didn't want to make the photographer the bad guy. He's just representing something like the poverty porn. Um, how did you conceive of that? That's a bit of a new element compared to your other two films. Uh, can you explain that a bit to her? You know what's what, what is <laughs> a kind of a frightening thing is when you when you see a uh, when you see people putting elements of, of my, let's say my films together, I can see uh, re repeating, uh, um, you know, themes that I, I'm not necessarily thinking about in the process, you know, now that you showed the missionaries taking pictures of the local people, it's a uh, similar, I, I, I guess in every one of my film, there is some kind of woman singing at one point or <laughs> that is a, uh, that is uh, that is funny to to see for myself, uh, and I think Martin, you said something very very true. Is that I I don't want to point my finger to that photographer and say look at this asshole is is exploiting these poor Cubans with photography. He's just another tourist among a billion tourists on this planet, um, transgressing privacy, transgressing uh, terrain, transgressing cultures. Intruding, it's inter it's interventionism. It's uh, interventionism, um, and uh, and it's even worse, of course, when it's paired with this uh, with this pseudo humanitarian uh, um, discourse. Like, of course, they are poor. We need to help, etc. So that that makes it even worse, um, and that makes it so painful intellectually. But again, it is. Um, in, a, in a let's say in a, in a different context in an isolated way it's just one guy with a camera in old Havana <laughs> what is what is what is new about that nothing you know so so that that is really the, the striking um, again the striking power of, of documentary of non-fiction cinema is uh, context is everything it's just how how you prepare a narrative how you prepare people how you sensibilize people to certain things um and that how you can find your way uh, without the movie kind of imposing the, the thought to you 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 think about it because you have this set of um of of of, of things already in your experience you know that uh, taking a picture is is a form of extractionism mm -hmm. but it can also be a form of contact i mean i i i, I do of course, the, the paradox in this whole situation, uh, and that's but that's a whole different debate. Of, is a, that I was also in that courtyard, also with a camera, and I also have a white face, and that's of course very problematic. <laughs> in this very context, in this very moment, I guess I guess I guess we talked to, uh, uh, and it's, it became of course uh, a part of the theme of Epicentro. Well, again, like all my films, like what am I doing here, and why, and what is it, you know? And of course, I could say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making a movie. I'm a movie maker, so that's it. You know, I don't have to apologize for making a movie, being a movie maker. But in this very situation, uh, I was in the shadow of a typical tourist plowing into this courtyard where in that moment, I did not know anyone. And in the eyes of these people, I was just another guy with another camera. It was just one more even. It's even worse even. You know? yeah. So, so... Of course, I mean, I, 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 it was in my neighborhood in Havana. I went back to, to see these people the next day. I showed them the footage, gave them, made them laugh. Um, we had a beer together. We became friends, and 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 that's it. But I can do that because I'm not a, a tourist because I'm I'm living there for three years, uh, and because I have time to reflect on that, and because reflecting on images is is a part of making images, etc. But the dialectic between taking images 
or or giving something it's very very important again you know so for me as a filmmaker uh is a lot of people say do you show the footage to the people i yes i do uh as much as i can mm -hmm. of course in sudan there is no uh, multiplex cinema where all the people that are in my film that i shot in sudan most of them will never see the, see the film but as much as i can I, I i shoot and then take a time in the evening and and throw a little uh, on a little sheet uh, a piece of the scene i just shot and, and it, that creates a connection it makes people understand who i am what am i doing and also when i'm let's say taking a taking a, uh, um, a moving image of someone that I'm talking to, like you are taking my image now, by the way, you're filming me, but you're not exploiting me. You are giving me, you're giving me uh, existence. You are making me talk about my experience, share my experience. And I don't feel like you are taking my picture no. and put it well, on the internet, it's, which it's is about, also It's true, about exchange, way. of but, course. But, so, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's about the, 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 the connection. It's about yeah. exchange and connection. And so, I, with, so uh, with, I think uh, with the last two clips you bear, with yeah. the, the two ladies in We Come as Friends, and the coming one that we'll play now, uh, with where we see uh, the children, Leonelis and uh, Agnelis, etc., you give people agency, you give them a voice, and maybe it even a voice at a time when you when you didn't even expect it it looks like it there's a magic moment in the uh, happening and and you catch that um can you say a bit about that uh, it feels so wonderful it's it's like magic to me your your your, your scenes like that are magic like old fashioned cinema magic yeah well cinema is is magic and it's it is also can be diabolic and there's not one dictator on this planet that hasn't understood that so uh, it's that's a known that's a known uh, problem um, but i guess you refer to a, a scene where leonelli says she wants to be an actress is that uh, on the rooftop um, is that the, that the scene you want to show yeah and it's also with una where they where they play uh, i mean i shouldn't say that maybe but it's it's also yes. the end of the film yeah. and also the, and again, the film I mean, is propaganda but yeah what, <laughs> yes i mean the the magic is is the right word and it's it's something that cannot be explained it cannot be explained it, it is something that you uh, I don't find the right word, and I don't want to uh, use this uh, esoteric terminology of energy and and vibes and so. I, I, I don't I don't know what to say. But when you talk to someone, when you film someone, um, again to come back to the thought we had just before is is instead of taking that person's image, I'm giving my full attention mm -hmm. to that person and my full presence, and I am physically filming. Uh, like this, my camera is as big as this. I'm looking at the people, and I'm as far away as my arm is long, usually. And I'm looking into the, these people's eyes, and the camera is also, by the way, just there. So it looks like this person is looking to me and talking to me. And the camera is not only not there, but it's it's giving the link between me and this person, and it gives me, also as a filmmaker, that uh, special kick that now is the moment this is the moment now is the the moment of truth so to say i, I think I'm that's a wonderful and what i see and every movement i make with my little camera every every movement i make with my, with my camera has a, an intention and an energy that is followed by a million people and conditioning a million people's lives in a way so uh, so i am holding also the the lives uh, parts of, of everyone's life who is who is, uh, who is exposed to that that movie yep. and every choice every cut every every light every thought every word on it is 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 being shared so i am i'm in this hyper um, in this hyper uh, concentration which i'm also now in a little bit mm -hmm. because i'm talking to you and i'm happy to talk to you yeah. <laughs> and 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 there is something happening you know even we have a delay and even um, <laughs> well that's maybe a great uh, physically, a great but, um, bridge to the, 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 to the magic yeah. to the another yeah. clip of uh, epicentro it's um yeah. quite a light ending and then we'll do some questions so uh it's a, just a two minute clip and then we'll do some questions uh 
let's roll it. Y gracias a, a nuestro líder nacional de Cuba, Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruz, tenemos centro de trabajo, hospitales, trabajos y escuelas. Barrio Muerte, venceremos. ¡Venceremos! Somos la brigada Conrado Benítez. Somos la vanguardia de la revolución. ¡Abajo el imperialismo! ¡Arriba la libertad! ¡Cuba! ¡Cuba! ¡Este es la sí. ¡Venceremos! Que es muy tarde. 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 No quieres que. No quieras hacer Eres un error de la vida. Eres un error de la vida. Y tú tampoco deberías ser mi mamá. Mira ese lirio que el tiempo lo consume. Y hay una fuente que lo hace florecer. Well, I think this is a wonderful kind of last clip. It gives hope, it gives light. Thank God, we, there may, may also be light. Um, <laughs> so, so where will you go to after this film? I mean, this film is a bit different, it seems. Of course, it also touches on the themes that are in your other two films, uh, and also Kisangani Diary. But I feel you're maybe looking for a bit of light. Is that true? Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, I guess, uh, you sound a bit like a shrink now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to meet, we should meet Martin. <laughs> sorry, <you and> I. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> I, can, I, can, I can lie down. There's a, there's a divan here. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I have to give a, a tiny a, a tiny hint of the context. The scene which I saw was not exactly as a piece of film. It was a bit of a synthesis. Um, and when the kid is being beaten up by its mom, that's an uh, enacted scene that is so uh, true that it looks even in real life so true. And then they were they were just because this kid wants to be an actress and Una Chaplin this wonderful actress who she is in reality was kind of t teaching the kids how to fake uh, um you know a, a beating up scene and and it was in in the in the context of epicenter you see it and you take it for real and uh, and that is a part of the reflection of what is very real and what is fake what is uh, acting what is not etc mm -hmm. so just to give you that uh, context because people see the scene and don't understand that. And then on when they dance and sing on the terrace, that's my little house. In that was my little house in Old Havana and on a rooftop, um, which I built with my hands, essentially a little shack out of wood on a, on a roof, which was my center of production, my editing suite in in Havana. And I give you an answer which I should have answered you earlier about the method, I always shoot and edit at the same time. I, I, I shoot the scene uh, and it's as fresh as, uh, as, as hot, uh, hot little bread. And I spent, when I when I'm motivated the next night or two or three nights, I'm just cooking it down and understanding what just happened. And sometimes going straight back to the same place, to the same people and just keep going. And, and it is kind of this echo of, of shoot and edit and, and slowly understand something and then show it to the people that I've been shooting with and then they understand the process better and they understand better how I, what makes me tick and what makes me kind of, um, uh, yeah, turn on, uh, you know, get, get what gets me going. Uh, and that is a process that is very, uh, very beautiful. And of course, I, 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 I am in the eyes of a lot of people, just this completely crazy dude. But they also understand that there is an intention and there is something that 
is going to come out of it and they're a part of this process people i film and that's very very beautiful um to experience again and it's an experience and uh this scene where una is singing with her little um uh, ukulele and the kids are dancing was the actual day when i took my airplane to leave cuba after after three years or three years of work it was the same day and it was again it was that moment where it had to happen this kind of absolute uh, moment of absolute beauty and 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 coherence and we were una and the two kids uh, and i we were all crying mm-hmm. at the end you know it was just it was like too much of everything and uh, i even let the camera run and then the kids would film us crying and and of course <laughs> i cut that out because mm-hmm. uh, it's uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> who, who but, who <laughs> but, but, the... not, but it's uh, it's it's just to say that that it's it is a magic. You, you say you, you said you, you said the word, Martin. Uh, you said the word. It's it's magic, and it's magic because of a long process of 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 cooking things down, of thinking, of uh, plotting up, uh, researching, uh, and being a bit of a scientist also in 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 finding a way to how to how to create a narrative for very film, but then when you're in front of a reality it opens up to to the 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 magic of cinema yeah <laughs> those sounds like really wonderful final words but we have one last question for you Hubert, because our hour is basically up but we've been talking about you know you talked about cinematic literacy and the, the way that we understand what you're trying to say without a lot of information and context. And you approach this documentary filmmaking as an art form, as an artist. Is this kind of filmmaking still possible? Do you find it, I mean, you you you, ex- you express a fantastic system where you can travel and, and work for many years on the same project. Do you find this is still possible in this day and age? Yeah, I mean, it, it is still possible, but I have to say, um, which is very, it's a bit painful, is that at, after every film I make, you know, some years pass, um, you, you give all your energy, um, all your life, all your blood, all your thoughts, all your or time, all your money into something, and then I'm always at the same point. I'm completely exhausted. I'm completely burned out financially. And I'm literally on a cat pad on, on like crawling and giving away the film and it opens up and it is in the light and I'm and I'm just hanging in some corner and trying to 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 survive, you know. Mm-hmm. And then slowly you come back and I'm now in the phase to slowly come back and I live on my little farm in in uh, in, in south of south of Paris, grow my own food and surrounded by beautiful friends that flock in with a lot of children too. Um, and then I recover slowly, so, but it, it is such an, such a crazy thing. It's a, I only barely make it out, uh, mm. uh, every time. And is it still possible? Yeah, it's still possible. I mean, I'm, I, I, I think it's not very hard for me to find money for, for films, unlike other people, I guess, but also I must say that I, I don't need a lot of money for, you know, I don't like, I. I, I, you know, I can tell I, I can tell the money uh, people that I won many awards that I was nominated for an Oscar, and I don't need uh, seven million to make a movie. You know, so so that's that's kind of the easier part for me to to finance films, but uh, to make a film that makes sense and that that touches hearts and souls, that's the hard part every time, and it takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot. You know, but. Uh, if your if your question includes is it still possible will cinema still exist that's a that's a meta question of course because uh, I don't know maybe in ten years we we're gonna just live on on Zoom and we're gonna mm-hmm. have our three D uh, holograms of uh, <laughs> Cecilia and Martin in in my little <laughs> guest room in the little inn of uh, which uh, which would be sad you know of course but yeah. but I think. I think uh, this this art form, uh, and I think the art form is, is a, an important point because I think uh, documentary nonfiction filmmaking is uh, is too often confused with uh, reportage, with uh, with some kind of 
partisan, um, you know, uh, intention-driven, uh, charity-driven uh, kind of forms, which I'm not interested in. Um, but when it is an art form and when it uh, when it is seen and read intelligently as such, then it's it is uh, fantastic, and it will always exist. It's just a question uh, in how, what what's the extent and. Mm. I hope it will extend. It will extend because uh, because humans uh, have have invented uh, one way to communicate that's audiovisual language, and then it, it it has it has to extend. I mean, it has to develop, and we will uh, watch um, movies in in two or three generations that are much more sophisticated in its uh, visual language, I guess, than than we do now, and make them and and make and understand them and. And, and 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 educate so to say audiences to to read them hmm. thank, you much, uh, thank you very much thank you very much you bear it's been an amazing ride uh, your career has been an amazing yeah. ride uh, we can people yeah. who want to still see this can watch it back yeah. uh, on the platform of nordis panorama afterwards uh, soon it will be there thanks cecilia thanks to the staff of Nordis Panorama doing all this, uh, the technical people. And um, I'd really love to see you again for real soon. And I guess Cecilia too, and uh, <laughs> hopefully others too, seeing you for real and seeing each other for real, because that's really what matters. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for taking the time, Hubert. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for talking with us. Muchos besos. <laughs> <laughs> Muchos besos eh, por mis amigos en Cuba también. Mucho amor y venceremos. Nice. <laughs>